than you would think. But raptors are what we're specifically going to think about. And a raptor versus a bird of prey is the specific use of weaponry. So raptors use their talons um, to actually catch their food. So they've got those sharp claws that they grab and kill their prey with, where other birds of prey, like say that shrike or a cardinal, they use their bills and um, you know objects around them to, to get their prey for the most part. They don't have the talon type thing. So that's laying out the, the definitions to start with here. Um, and then, so we have a lot of raptors that uh, live here year round, some that winter here and some that migrate through here. And so you can see in this um, map here, the raptors right here are in the blue. And so we are along a major migratory pathway for a lot of raptor species. There's one in kind of the central United States, over the Rockies and along the coasts. So they're using, um, our coastline and our mountains along here for uh, to, to help help them get to where they're going in the winter time or in the springtime. Um, and depending on the species, some of them come down this far and then stay here. Some breed here and then leave here, go all the way down to South America. It really just kind of depends on what species we're talking about. But the way that they do that, um, the raptors typically are all daytime migrators or uh, diurnal migrators. Whereas a lot of songbirds will actually migrate at night to avoid all the raptors flying during the day during migration season. And what they want to do, because they're not actively hunting this whole time and they eat a lot of food, um, they have a high metabolism compared to a lot of uh, or some other birds, um, they look for a free ride. So they want to conserve all the energy that they can while they're migrating. And so they use wind currents during the heat of the day. As the atmosphere heats up, it creates thermals. And so rising columns of hot air um, occur over bigger open areas, um, it, you know, parking lots, uh, malls, um, any places like that where the air heats up or the ground heats up, the air rises. They use it like an elevator. And they kind of just go way, way up and then they'll then start to soar and go to the next thermal and then go way, way, way up and then they'll soar and glide to the next one. And so it's kind of like a, a series of elevators and it, some birds will just go for, it seems like, possibly hundreds of miles without having to flap their wings uh, because they use this air current mechanism. And another uh, uplifting um, or updraft, it's also uplifting, I guess, <laughs> mechanism that they use is called convergent lifting. So when you have a flat piece of land and the wind comes across and then hits uh, mountains or a hillside or buildings, skyscrapers, it creates an updraft. The wind only has one place to go, so it goes up. And so that's why they glide along um, mountain ridges and cliff faces and kind of near cities and things like that. It's just another free ride. Um, and so you'll actually get some really good places of uh, concentrated raptor migration in places like Caesar's Head or if anyone's from up north or has been up there, um, a place called Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania. It's this great funnel along these mountain ridges where just thousands of birds can move through in a day. So very cool, but that's the main way that they migrate. But during that migration, they face a lot of issues. Um, this specific bird is uh, kind of a famous one. It's from New York City and it was the mate, who was a female to the pale male uh, red-tailed hawk, which is, um, he is kind of a local celebrity in New York City because, you know, he's very uh, noticeable to the public. But unfortunately, his mate, Lima, is what her name was, um, died from rodenticide poisoning. So that means rat poison. Um, as we all know, there's lots of rats in New York City. And if you use rodenticides or the anticoagulant poisons that the rats eat, and then it causes them to bleed internally. Unfortunately, if other predators eat it, like this red-tailed hawk, they then also die from secondary poisoning. Um, and so this is just a great infographic to show you that if you use those types of poisons and you use them readily, you're not affecting just the rats um, and you know taking care of that issue, but you're uh, taking care of or <laughs> taking care of killing um, a lot of predators like uh, hawks, eagles, owls, bobcats, coyotes, wolves, all the way up to cougars. So it's a, a big issue. And for some of these top predators who have really low populations anyway, it's an even bigger problem. Um, you uh, probably are familiar with the um, bobcat situation on Kiwa Island. A lot of their bobcats have died very recently from rodenticide poisoning. And so, um, you know, a couple groups are working on trying to get uh, the local officials to ban rodenticides or anticoagulants and things like that. So that they're trying to work on the solution because it's really put a big dent in their uh, bobcat population and probably other raptors as well. Um, lead poisoning is another big issue for raptors and specifically ones that will uh, scavenge um, like bald eagles and vultures and red-tailed hawks. And actually a lot of raptors will scavenge. It's much easier to 
catch something that's already dead and lying on the ground and not running away. <laughs> so they're very opportunistic. Uh, but lead poisoning um, essentially causes neurological issues. And Emily might be able to go into a little bit more detail on that a little bit later. But th this is what they look like when they have lead poisoning. They're just really out of it. They can't function. They can't fly. They can't feed themselves. And it builds up in their system. And so one thing, if you are a hunter or you know hunters, making the switch from lead ammo to copper core ammo is a big deal. This is where the lead is coming from. It's not necessarily that the birds are getting shot, but they are eating something that has already been shot. So say a deer has been shot, it runs across the road, gets hit by a car, an eagle finds it, eats it, ingests the lead pellets, then it gets lead poisoning. So when a lead bullet hits a target, it fragments and explodes. And so there's all these little bits of lead in the meat. Uh, whereas a core, copper core bullet, or there's a few other ones, I think steel is another option, they don't shatter. And so the birds don't ingest them. Um, also, this is what a lot of people don't really think of, but if you've ever been on a road trip and been eating a banana and you don't want to leave the stinky peel in the car or you have an apple core and you think, oh, I don't want to wait for another two hours so we get to a rest stop and throw this thing out. So you chuck it out the window and you think, oh, it's no big deal. It's biodegradable. It's not really litter. Um, something will eat it. But that is actually the problem. Oftentimes something will eat it, like this little squirrel right next to the road. And what likes to, uh, well, as you know, I'm sure we've all dodged squirrels in our cars, but sometimes they don't make the right calculation. They zig and then they zag when they should have zigged and they end up under the car tire, which then attracts the scavengers to the side of the road. Uh, black vultures, turkey vultures, hawks, eagles, owls, they all will uh, scavenge at some point, which then makes them much more susceptible to getting hit by cars themselves. Or um, our roads actually create these great edge habitats where you have forested sides, a little bit of grass, and an open area. And so birds like red-tailed hawks love to hunt in those habitats. So he sees a squirrel all the way across the highway, he dives down to get it, and then he gets hit by a car. Um, so long story short, try not to throw food out of your window. You might think it is harmless, but it is actually not. It's attracting animals to the side of the road where they can get injured. But that being said, those are all my PSAs for raptor conservation um, in our area. And now I'm going to get into a couple different groups of raptors, um, and we're going to start with the occipiters. So I'm going to uh, start with them, and then Emily's going to talk about the buteos in just a minute. But to begin, um, occipiters is a word for forest hawks. So they're characterized by long skinny toes, short round wings, long narrow tails, and they're really good at maneuvering in tight spaces. Um, we have two here, the sharp shinned hawk and the Cooper's hawk, and they can be really tough to tell apart. So on the left, I even have to think about it when I look at these two pictures and I made the PowerPoint. Um, on the left, we have a sharp shinned hawk. So just looking at it, I, I bet a lot of us have these little shepherd's hook in the backyard for um, bird feeders and things like that. It looks like a smaller bird compared to what that shepherd's hook size probably is gonna be. So this is a sharp shinned hawk. They're typically smaller, although a very large sharp shinned hawk female and a small male Cooper's hawk can overlap in size. So not always the best way to tell. They typically have a darker hood though. So this hood on their, uh, their head, it kind of goes down the back of their head. Their tail is a little bit more squared off or a sharp corner. It's one of the little things I used to um, remember which is which, and they're smaller, and their calls are also different. So this is going to be a sharp shinned hawk call. I think you guys can hear that? Yeah? Okay. So, don't need to listen to that for too long, but very high pitched and squeaky. Compared to the Cooper's hawk, you can see this uh, guy has a dead cardinal. So comparatively in size, this is a bigger bird, uh, possibly a female based on how big it is. It has um, a curved edge tail, it's more rounded. So I think like curved C, Cooper's Hawk. Um, it has a cap instead of a hood, so the blue doesn't extend quite as far down, and it's bigger. And this is what they sound like. <laughs> kind of like they're laughing. Um, so that's what they look like close up, but in flight, it can be a little trickier because you don't have a sense of scale. So when you're looking at um, acipters in flight, on the left here, we have a sharp shinned hawk. And so if you look at it, it kind of looks like a T. Their wrists extend pretty far forward, and so it's almost even with their head when they're flying. And then when they fly, they flap really, really fast. So if you see what you think is an occipiter and you try and count the wing beats, if you can't keep up with it, it's a sharp shinned hawk. But if you're looking at um, a Cooper's hawk, which is on the right here, you can see his head sticks out a lot further in front of his wrist. So it's almost like a flying cross. And when they flap their wings, it's still fast, but you can keep up with the count. 
So in uh, raptor surveys, it, they can be a little tricky. And then this is actually a really good picture of their tail too. So see the sharp shinned hawk with the sharp corners right here compared to the Cooper's hawk with the curved. So those are easy ways to kind of tell those two apart. All right, so those are your recipiters. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Emily to take on the Budios. All right, thanks, Jen. And yeah. I also have to apologize. I um, have a Blue Jay, our educational um, ambassador at Byler Forest is flying around and he knows the areas that he's not supposed to get into. Um, so I, if you see me, you know, um, you know, try to get him to away from the computer what that's actually one of his favorite things so um you might see him um so budios budios are are um probably one of my my favorite of, of all the raptors uh the, you know they're they're the ones that, that are very present we see them um they have those broad soaring wings um shorter thicker toes for catching mammals um and actually this is a great picture because um I don't know if anybody knows what kind of budio this is, but if you do, um, it uh, the name of this bird, um, it, it, the, the first part of the name of this bird um, is actually um, not present in this image. So this is this is a juvenile bird, um, and uh, but I love I love looking at this picture because this particular budio is sort of the cornerstone or keystone budio of of all of them that uh, when I look at that um, nice belly band and that bright white um, breast chest area up there, um, that's a red-tailed hawk. Next slide. And here we see uh, the red-tailed hawk uh, as an adult once they go through that mold and get that beautiful red tail. Um, the juveniles, like in the previous slide, they have that barring in the in the on the tail feathers. Um, but once once they go through um, that 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 next molt in their life, and and they, that red starts coming through, um, you can see them, especially when they're flying, um, that beautiful red, um, almost like a caramely orangey amber red that that you see with the sun coming through those feathers. Next slide. Um, so when I when I think of red-tailed hawks, um, the first thing uh, we always think about um, it's called comma dash comma, and it's um, so when you see the comma, Jen's pointing it out right now with the mouse, um, that dark comma like shape, and then the dash is the patagium. Um, it's a very the red-tailed hawk has a very dark patagium. Um, and then the um, right there, the barring of the chest. So, um, so we always say comma dash comma. Um, and, it, and if you can master a red-tailed hawk, you can really master just about any raptor, I think, in my, in, from my own personal experience. So once you have that bird nailed down, the other ones sort of kind of fall into place. But red-tailed hawks are very visible. They're present, like I said before. Um, they love sort of being on the edge of forests. So, um, you see them, uh, they're very adaptable. Um, one of the interesting things about red-tailed hawks in my experience is when I've encountered young red-tailed hawks, like in the first picture with the barring of the tail, their behavior is so different than adult red-tailed hawks. So the young ones, um, that first year of life is, is, is sort of do or die, literally, and they don't get a lot of training from their parents. So they can do some pretty goofy things. Um, they, you know, I will often get calls from people and they'll say, well, there's this hawk in my yard and he's acting really bizarre and, or, or he's harassing my cat or my dog. Um, and, uh, and it's the first year, the juvenile red-tailed hawks, they get a little desperate and they can sometimes act a little goofy, but as they get older, they, they really chill out and they, and they, and they become, um, just such uh, a much, I, the best way for me to say it is that they just become so, um, just stoic and um, forgiving and um, and they're very forgiving in the way that they're very adaptable to what we do to the to the ecosystem and environment around us. Next slide. Um, so red-shouldered hawks, um, these are the birds that you hear a lot um, and uh, so you'll see the black and white um, barring um, on the tail and and um, you'll see 
I would really pay attention to the tail in this slide because we're going to show you another video um, where a lot of people get the two confused. Um, um, but the red shoulders, um, in which is uh, the name um, uh, where the name comes from, um, and that you can see in flight. Um, when you're looking up at a red-shouldered hawk, uh, often you'll see what we call these like crescent windows um, that, that you can sort of see through the wings when you're looking up, these small wingo windows that are towards the end of the wings, kind of where the commas were on the red-tailed hawk. Um, and they even have a reddish uh, chest. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, if you can see here, a lot of barring as well. Um, they're smaller than the red-tailed hawk. Um, they do go for smaller prey and they are incredibly loud, very vocal, um, very dramatic. Um, the blue jay that's flying around right now in, um, at my home um, actually does a very good um, <laughs> um, mimic of, of their call. And I think Jen has it. And you're on mute, Jen. I don't know if that- I, I already played it and like, it's so loud. <laughs> I was on mute. Let me remedy that. Wait for it. Yeah, so they have very, a family in the neighborhood and they have been driving everybody nuts. <laughs> yeah, very loud birds. And actually in the fall, an interesting fact about them, when we get a lot of rain, a lot of times you'll see red-shouldered hawks um, lower to the ground because they start sort of looking for grubs. Um, and this is, this is that time of year, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a few days of rain, the, the, uh, your lawns will get saturated, and you may see a red-shouldered hawk on your mailbox um, just kind of staring at the ground. And uh, so a lot of times they'll even go for grubs and other insects that are in the ground. Next slide. All right, so here is the broadwing hawk, and I this this bird um, I I just love, and it's always a treat when I get to see one, especially in South Carolina. They're not as common, um, so if you look at the tail on, on this bird, um, you'll notice that really dark band there at the bottom, um, which is it's very thick. Um, it's a subterminal band, and um, that last white band is wider than the others, if you notice that. Um, and so it's not uniform, this, the, that, that, the, the bands are not uniform like you would see on a red-shouldered hawk. And then they also have a dark outline of the wing. It's almost like taking a Sharpie marker. If you were to draw this bird and trace it, you would take a Sharpie marker and go all, all along the sides of it. So that's, that's another, um, thing to look for to um, to identify this bird in a field, a field mark. Uh, they're small, they're stocky, they're about the size of a crow, believe it or not, and they're one of the few North American raptors that flocks during migration in very large flocks. Next slide. And the Northern Harrier, I love this bird and I could talk a lot about them. Um, slim body, long wings, long tail, long slender legs. Um, this bird in, um, in the white rump, Jen just is, was pointing that out. That is, so that white rumped wall it is always there regardless of age or, or, um, or sex of the bird, uh, that, that rump is there. Um, the, the male and female are, are very different and even the young birds are, can be very different. So this can be a very confusing bird. They call it the great fooler. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention that about this bird that is unique, I think, and something sort of special is they're a lot like Cooper's hawks, which um, their behavior, um, they're, they're sort of hyperactive. Cooper's hawks and sharp shinned hawks, they, whenever I feel, I'm, I'm more of an anxious person, I get anxious really easily, and, I'm, and I always think like, you know, don't be like a Cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk, because literally, you know, you, you, if you look at them the wrong way, I mean, they could drop dead. I mean, they're just a really, really high energy, anxious birds. So the Northern Harrier kind of has some of those traits, but also has some of the physical traits of the Cooper's Hawk. It has very long legs. This bird, um, it's, uh, you, when you see it, it's usually flying low um, and it's foraging on the wing. So it's capturing these um, mainly small to medium mammals and birds. 
um, its face. Um, it, it appears owlish, as you can see. Um, and uh, that facial uh, rough disc is uh, similar in structure and function um, to most of what owls have. Um, so they rely heavily on auditory cues as well as visual. And in flight, um, often they fly slowly, um, low over the ground with heavy flaps, tilting glides, but they can turn so quick. Um, and uh, they also have a dihedral, uh, dihedral uh, flight pattern. So almost like a, uh, when you think of a turkey vulture, which uh, Jen will talk about in a little bit. But these birds are interesting. The females, um, especially in South Carolina, they love rainstorms. And that's usually when you'd see them like on a post and they'll be facing, they'll be facing the rain and, and it's the way that they bathe. Um, and then in the winter here in South Carolina, often you will find these birds, um, these individual uh, roosting together com communally on the ground. Um, this is, um, so this picture, this, this slide that Jen's showing now, um, this is the male, this is, um, you know, what we would call um, the gray ghost, uh, uh, which we don't see uh, as commonly as the females here in South Carolina, but you do see that white underwing, really long tail, long wings, uh, very linear. Uh, next slide. And I think I'm back. I think that's back to you, Jen, actually. I think it is. All right. So I'm going to talk about falcons. So thank you, Emily, for the beautios and um, the harriers. Well, only the one harrier. Uh, but falcons, we have three species here. And actually, right now is one of the best times to see them. Um, usually, October is when most of them start really migrating through. I feel like they're kind of after some of the beautios and other occipiters that migrate, but that's just general observation. Uh, so we have the peregrine falcon, the merlin, and the American kestrel. And I'm going to go um, from the smallest to the biggest here. So the American kestrel is the smallest falcon we have, and it is sexually dimorphic. So that means males and females are noticeably different, just like the harriers, what Emily was mentioning before. Um, the males definitely have a lot more color to them. They're, they have a brighter slate blue and a rusty red, and they have these very distinct um, mustache feathers. So the feathers underneath their eyes actually act like, um, almost like the grease paint that football players wear. They wear it to reduce the glare from the sun because they can't wear sunglasses when they're playing football. Well, falcons, because they fly so quickly, they can't have um, built-in uh, eyebrow or hat brims like uh, beautios do. They usually have a bigger orbital bridge to kind of create almost like a hat brim to help shield the, their eyes from the sun. Well, because falcons go really, really fast, they can't have that. So mustache feathers are pretty characteristic of the falcon family. Um, and you'll see this is the male. So they are brighter. They've got that nice rusty red tail, almost like a red-tailed hawk color, but they've got this dark band here. Um, the nice slate blue, and then these dots are usually pretty apparent when they're flying as well. Um, but very fast, very quick, and you can often, or most often when I see them, um, Emily and I saw some driving a silver bluff the other day, they're almost always at the edge of a field hanging out on a telephone line. And when you see one bird sitting by itself and its tail is kind of bobbing um, in the wintertime, um, look for a kestrel, because usually they're sitting away from all the starlings or the doves sitting on the other side of the telephone wire, and they're hunting, you know, whatever they're looking for in the field, which is usually rodents, um, and specifically kestrels and some of the other edge hunting raptors can see in UV light. And when uh, rodents run, they actually dribble urine. And so they leave like little fluorescent trails that these birds can um, use to hunt. They could see highly trafficked areas by rodents and we'll just hang out and wait for them. So um, that's pretty cool. And then the females you can see are just a, a bit more model. They do have a lot of rusty pretty color, but they're definitely more muted. And another interesting thing about them is that they're cavity nesters, which not all raptors are. Many of them build their own nests or do a scrape on the ground or a nest on a ledge. But American kestrels will nest in cavities. So that was one leading factor to their decline. Over time was a lack of cavities, just like bluebirds. Uh, they declined because we took down all the snags thinking they were ugly. Um, but it's very important for them. So putting up houses for them and protecting snag trees is really good for their conservation. And then if you notice, because they are such small, cute little raptors, they do eat things like caterpillars um, and insects and grasshoppers. And so using a lot of insecticides in big agricultural areas has also impacted their conservation and numbers as well. So something to consider uh, if you're managing a farm. <laughs> 
The next uh, raptor, this one to me is the trickiest because from a distance, it kind of looks like a juvenile uh, occipiter, like a juvenile Cooper sock or Sharpton hawk. Um, it has long skinny toes, kind of like them. It has a streaking, uh, but you know, they will have this mustache feather um, too. It's a lot uh, lighter, it's not as apparent, but it's there. Um, and then the males will have kind of a slate gray back compared to the, the brown back of the females. So that's another kind of giveaway. But when this is a, a female Merlin, I don't know, I think, think they're kind of tricky. And it appears to be eating a Carolina wren. So bird eaters for the most part. Let me, sorry, my mouse is being a little tricky today. Then peregrine falcons, they are some of the most well-known falcons throughout the world. I believe their scientific name, uh, Falco peregrinus, in Greek somehow translates to world traveler or something like that because they are all over the world and they declined really really heavily during the time of DDT because they're an apex predator and through um, the sport of falconry, captive populations and zoos um, and a lot of conservation work they've actually bounced back really really strongly from the time of DDT when I think there was like a handful of pairs in the you know lower 48 so an incredible bird, but they have the most exaggerated mustache feather out there, um, as you can see. It's almost like a big, you know, Greco-Roman helmet or something like that. It just comes down all across their cheeks, and they have this nice, pretty bluish color. Juveniles would be a little bit more brown, and you'll see they've got really long, skinny toes, a lot like the occipiters, but those nails qu aren't quite as, you know, big as the uh, Budios, like the red-tailed hawks, their talons are a bit smaller. But the way that they actually kill birds, it's really interesting because people think, oh, falcons are the fastest flyers in the world. And yes and no, falcons are the fastest fallers in the world. Um, they've been clocked at going 260 miles an hour uh, in a straight dive. And that was done a little bit artificially. They probably wouldn't normally reach those speeds. Someone took a, a trained bird up into a hot air balloon really, really high and had them dive and they clocked it that way. But what they do is they hunt some of the fastest flyers in the world, which is the lowly, unappreciated uh, pigeon or rock dove. They eat a lot of doves. And if you put a falcon and a dove in a straight race, a dove is actually going to win. So sustained flight going forward, doves are faster. And so to be able to catch them, because they're nice and meaty, uh, peregrine falcons will go way, way up. They'll put the sun to their back, and so the birds don't see them coming, and they'll go in that really fast stoop. When they get down to the bird, they'll actually ball up their feet and punch them out of the air. Um, and just stun them. And when they get them down to the ground, it's difficult to see in this picture. He can't really see it, but there is almost a tooth-like projection that comes out of their beak. It's not an actual tooth. It's just the shape of it. And it's perfectly shaped to sever the spinal cord right at the base of the skull in just one quick bite. Um, so they're very fast, efficient killers and really, really cool birds. And I don't think I had, no, I guess I didn't have a call for them, but um, all right, so next I'm gonna move on to kites here. That's another group of raptors. Emily, am I, I think I'm doing kites, or are you doing kites? No, I, I, um, I can't hear you. I think you're doing kites, maybe? I don't remember. <laughs> Either way, we both can do kites. Um, uh, but, but yeah, no, kites, uh, you know, they're called kites because of, of their flight style. Um, you know, I'm sure probably, probably a lot of you have seen Mississippi kites. Um, um, hopefully swallow-tailed kites, um, but they're able to um, hang in the air without flapping their wings. They hunt and eat on the wing. Um, they have small bodies and uh, propor proportionally very large wings, enabling them to gracefully stay aloft without expending um, too much energy. Um, and um, one of the cool things about kites that, that I've um, that I've seen is sometimes when they when they begin to go into flight from um, let's say you know in the morning they will do a uh, a dive down a drop they'll extend their wings and they project upwards um, in thermals kites are often at higher elevations than um, than other raptors and um, and sexes are indistinguishable by plumage or size um, so really hard um, I've got a blue jay right here. Um, and uh, communal night roosts near nests are common and pre-migration roosts uh, can draw hundreds like you're seeing um, in this slide here. Um, bottomland, uh, bottomland hardwood forests uh, for nesting and, and grasslands for foraging, they, they need um, um, a, lot of, a lot of different types of, um, of habitats. Um, 
Um, they are one of the first, uh, I would say one of the first migrants, especially when it comes to raptors, um, besides your, your eagles, uh, that, that to arrive. A lot of them get here in February, um, uh, but, but usually March. Uh, Florida, um, they're, they're also the first to leave. Um, and once um, seen, I <laughs> got a food jay. Um, Anyway, uh, once seen along the Mississippi River as far north as Minnesota, um, this wild-tailed kite's range is now just about a, a third of, of that historic size in the last 40 years. Um, sadly, up to 80% of formerly, formerly common bird species um, um, have declined. And, uh, but most, most of their populations um, are in Florida um, now. And um, so, like I said before, they eat on the wing um, or they eat with, while they're flying. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll, you know, as they're going and they're soaring above a tree line, they'll take an entire nest of, 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 of birds, of nestlings uh, to their nest to feed. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're incredible. Um, but they do take, so once they catch the food, they will use their, their, their feet um, to bring the food up to their mouth and eat. And they, um, so bugs, um, different insects, lizards, snakes, birds, they eat a, a, just a, a very diverse diet, um, but mostly aerial insectivores. Um, and these types of birds, so your swallowtail kites, are the kind of birds that you want to uh, definitely um, report on eBird um, because because their numbers are declining and they're trying to find, you know, exactly how many there are out there, where they're going. Um, this is one of those birds that you want to make sure that you, you definitely use uh, a database like eBird to report. Next slide. Um, Mississippi kites, uh, so they are, um, they're probably one of my favorites. Um, I love their call. Um, it's, uh, it's awesome. Um, it's like they say their name, Mickey. Um, they have triangular tails instead of that, that fork tail that you saw with the swallowtail kite. Um, they're much more common than swallowtail kites. They love, you know, that they're in your neighborhoods. They're about the size of a crow, um, but they, um, they actually arrive much later than your swallowtail kites to South Carolina. And they leave a lot later and they typically leave, I mean, by the first week of September, if I see one the first week of September, um, I, I usually will 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 crack a beer, um, and that that's a pretty good sighting. Um, next slide. Okay. Oh, sorry, I was gonna try and play the call real quick. Okay. Mickey. Mickey. They're so cute. Yeah. So their shape and color are also very different from the swallowtail kites. They're like this beautiful silvery graphite like color. They have they they. Um, once they mature and become an adult, they have these blood red eyes um, that are uh, like a scarlet color. Um, Mississippi kites have always concerned me um, in, in the way that um, they are the kind of bird that if they fall out of the nest, the, the, the adult birds typically will not take care of them. And so I've seen situations where, you know, someone will find a, a Mississippi kite um, and they imprint on humans like this blue jay um, that you may see flying behind me, um, they imprint on humans very, very easily, which can be very, very dangerous. So this is one of those birds that, you know, you don't pick up and try to put back in the nest because uh, you, number one, you probably can't reach it. Um, this is a bird that, you know, you can take a picture, send it to us uh, and, and, and let us identify the bird and get it off to uh, someone who can raise it appropriately. Um, but yeah, this is, this is one of those birds where it's, it's it's just when um, imprinting is is a is a is a big issue. Next slide. Um, An osprey. Um, so the fish eagle, our fish eater. Their feet are so cool. Um, they they it's like sandpaper on the bottom of their talons. I just love it. Um, they also Jen and I were just talking the other day <laughs> about osprey and. Um, and we were talking about how much we love the smell of them. I don't know if any of you have ever smelled an osprey, but they do have a certain fragrance that is unlike anything else. And um, so they're able to dive into water without getting waterlogged. Um, 
you know, your bootios, uh, your, um, especially like red-tailed hawks after a, like a downpour of rain can get waterlogged or they can't fly. These birds, they, they have, there's oils that they, when they groom themselves, they put the oil, these, this, this perfect oil, right? Into their feathers so that they can totally submerge themselves and fly right out of water. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, bald eagles can't even do that. Um, and um, one of the one a cool fact about about osprey is that they love to put objects in their nests. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that before, but um, uh, so they will um, a lot of times find like a baseball because you'll see a lot of times they'll nest on in baseball fields or soccer fields. They'll up in the lights. Um, they will they will find an object and. Sometimes I've seen people have sent me pictures of a baby doll head. Um, I've seen baseballs. I've seen shoes um, that they'll they'll set in their nest to to kind of claim it as theirs. But um, they're large, um, almost eagle size, boldly marked with black and white on the underwings. Um, their long wings are crooked like a gull's. But what you want to remember with the osprey is that it has um, the the osprey has a tail that is much longer than its head. So when you look at gulls, gulls have equally sized heads and tails. And that's how some people, sometimes people get them confused. Um, and then I always like to, when they're, when they're flying um, like towards me, it's, it's like they're the, the, like the letter M. And when they're flying away from me, they're like the, the letter W. Um, and they're one of those birds during migration that I've seen um, some of them that have, um, like geo trackers on them, they will they will go south, and then the next thing you know, they're up in New Jersey, and then two days later, they're back down in uh, Daytona Beach. Um, these these uh, osprey um, definitely drift. They're found all over the world. Wherever there's water, there there's typically um, osprey. Uh, next slide. I have the uh, the calls lined up to uh, compare them. So whenever you're ready. <laughs> yeah, and do you, do you want to talk about bald eagles, Jen? Uh, do you wanna... Sure. Yeah, I'll uh, roll on the eagles here. So bald eagles, uh, Haliatus leucocephalus, which means salt loving um, and white headed. Uh, they are part of the sea eagle family, which means the feathers don't extend all the way down to their toes. And uh, they're a common sight, they start migrating into our area. Um, a couple weeks ago, actually, we started to see a number of eagles start to come in and start to hang around their nesting territories, um, start to build nests, uh, bring sticks and things like that. So depending on where you are in the country, their migratory patterns kind of go all over the place. But um, here, we just say they come here in the wintertime and they nest. So I have two calls. Um, one is what you often think about when you hear a bald eagle, and then one is the actual bald eagle call. So this is what Hollywood makes you think a bald eagle should sound like. Just the very strong, eh, kind of screaming eagle sort of sort of sound. But that is actually a red-tailed hawk. So anytime, even the Arbor Day Foundation, the tree people, they get it wrong too. They have an eagle fly up on their commercial and it's a red-tailed hawk. It drives me nuts. I've written many a letters, but um, this is what they actually sound like. A little whiny kind of laughing or you know bickering at each other not real strong and american i guess enough for the uh enough for hollywood or commercials but um yeah different from what you'd think now it takes a full five years to get the white head and the white tail uh and when they're juveniles they have this kind of mottled light coloration on them their tail isn't fully white their head isn't fully white and depending on if they're a hatch year all the way up to like a fourth year you can kind of well people who know eagles really well can kind of age them by year, looking at this pattern of um, kind of coloration on them. Um, so as they get older, their bill turns from like a dark gray to yellow, and then their head eventually turns white and their tail turns white. And they are uh, very, I think they're pretty easy to spot when they're flying, especially as adults. It's a bright white head and a white tail, but their wings just stick way, way out flat, like two big planks of wood. And so from a distance, they're really easy to spot. Um, and, you know, discern from a turkey vulture or a black vulture. They're just big and commanding presence in the sky. Now, one thing, you know, that people, they love to think of the eagle in such a 
strong, amazing um, hunter, uh, but they actually love to bully and harass other <laughs> birds for their meals. It gets the job done, they can feed their chicks, but they're what we call kleptoparasites. So some eagles will actually just hang out, barely do any hunting for their own, but find a, a good osprey who's really good at fishing and just wait for him to go catch something and then go beat him up um, until he drops a fish or harass him until he drops a fish. So this osprey is like, yep, I'm about to lose my fish. And uh, <laughs> so he's coming for it. This is um, the fun term for this is called kleptoparasitism. So they steal their parasitic in a way that they steal food from other animals. And I've um, heard of them doing this to great blue herons too. But they're also very good fishers and they will eat some other land-based prey and they're also scavengers. So we talked about them having issues with lead poisoning when they eat um, deer and other animals that have been hit by cars. So the other type of eagle that we will very rarely, very occasionally get here are golden eagles. And so they're in a different group. So we have the fish eagles, which is the bald eagle, and then the booted eagle, which includes golden eagles. Um, golden eagles are terrestrial hunters. They're also found worldwide, but their feathers extend all the way down to their toes. So it looks like they're wearing pants. Um, golden eagles are really creative hunters. Um, I've heard and seen videos of them picking up mountain goats and throwing them off cliffs in the Himalayans. Um, and there's one group of uh, golden eagles that will actually hunt a lot of tortoises and they'll pick them up and drop them on open rock faces to crack them open. Um, so they're really interesting um, in the way that they hunt. They'll also take out wolves. Uh, people in the Himalayas um, in Asia will actually train them to hunt wolves with them and foxes. So they're a very formidable predator. Um, but you can see they get their name, the golden eagle, by this beautiful kind of golden mane that they have back here. Now, as far as identification goes, it can be a little tricky because a juvenile bald eagle to the left here looks a lot like an adult uh, golden eagle. But golden eagles, when you're looking at the white patterns, you're going to see them concentrated on the ends of the wings, and it's going to be pretty solid colored elsewhere. And then the juvenile bald eagles have this modeling that's kind of spread out all over the place and has, um, you know, the white tail here. Just a second, sweetie. Okay. I'm almost done. Sorry. Um, Anyways, back to the golden eagles and bald eagles. Uh, if you think you've seen a golden eagle, you probably haven't. Try and get a p picture, even a crummy one, where you can kind of see those two end spots is good enough. Um, they do come to the coast and kind of the coastal Piedmont region during the wintertime, but in few numbers. So not impossible, but it is definitely possible. Yeah, and I was going to say there's a lot of research that's um, been going on with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and DNR that they're trying to get a, uh, a good number of, you know, to try to figure out exactly how many golden eagles do come to South Carolina. And, um, and so there are some areas where they're, um, you know, trying, trying to entice them um, so, that, so that we can get a better understanding of, of exactly how many are visiting um, in, in, in the winter months. So I just wanna throw that out there. Yeah, and also oh, one thing more thing. Right Oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking one more thing. This dawned on me today. I was thinking about this presentation. And golden eagles are, are they're, you know, much more of a Western uh, mm -hmm. bird, a Western eagle. And, and they're, they're one of the birds that I, that, that I think of as, and I get concerned, um, especially with, with the fires that are happening out West. So they, they're very, you know, all raptors are really, an, they're, they're a, um, an, indica uh, an indi uh, indicator species. They're, you know, it, if, if, if an ecosystem is failing, you're going to lose your raptors. And so because raptors are big and present and large, you can see them. Um, once you s stop seeing raptors, there's something wrong. And I've been thinking a lot about the golden eagle and the fires out west. And I think it's something that we should be, you know, watching in the future and, and to see, you know, what happens and, and how they adapt to that, those changes. Definitely, very good point. Um, so the next group of birds is uh, one that I love. Not many people have a huge appreciation for, but just to show you, I, I have an entire hour long um, lecture on just vultures by themselves. So you may have heard the term turkey buzzard, and that is actually false. Turkey buzzards are technically not really a thing. Um, a lot of us have grown up hearing that term, um, but the word buzzard actually refers to a hawk. But turkey vulture is the appropriate um, and more accurate term for um, when you're talking about vulture species. 
Uh, so common buzzards are a type of um, hawk that actually live in Europe. It's kind of like Europe's red-tailed hawk, um, you know, our version of it. And so when the first European settlers came over from Europe, they've been used to seeing a common buzzard that they're used to up over there. They saw the big turkey vultures flying in the sky, probably very prevalent. And so they said, oh, look, it's a, it's a buzzard. And so that's how that name kind of stuck. So next time you hear someone out in the field say, oh, there's a turkey buzzard, you can kindly correct them and feel very smart. Um, but black vultures are uh, the other species of vulture that we have. So I'm gonna go back to the turkey vulture real quick, just for ID sake. You can see the turkey vultures obviously have the red head. The juveniles don't though. So if you don't see a red head, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a turkey vulture. Um, they have very big nostrils or nares is the bird term for nostrils. And you can see through it. They're so big to um, smell better. Uh, you can see all the way through them. But the wings on a turkey vulture have that nice kind of silvery color from the tips all the way to the body. And their tails are a little bit more rounded. And they fly very similarly to the harrier that um, Emily was mentioning before with the dihedral flight pattern. So their wings tilt up in kind of a V and they kind of rock back and forth a little bit. Um, it's very graceful. But the black vulture is different in a number of ways. He has a very triangular tail, kind of squared off corners. There is only white at the tips of its wings. So underneath, it almost looks like he's wearing white gloves. Um, and then they also fly with a flatter wing and they do a quick flap, 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 flap glide kind of pattern. Almost like they're flying, then they forget how to fly and then they panic and then they flap real quick and then they go back to flying. Um, and their faces are a lot darker. They don't have the red skin. It's all uh, mostly black and the older they get, the kind of sootier it looks like they get almost wartier looking the older they get and they have very very thin slits for their nares or their nostrils so if you get that close to a vulture you know you probably kind of figure out which one it is but um they're really really neat birds and again i could go on for days about vultures so i'm just gonna stop myself there because i won't stop otherwise um and we have our photo credits here but uh emily and i are happy to take any questions that you have i think matt may have been monitoring the chat or collecting any if you guys put any there but um we are ready for questions if you have any yeah um th well thank you jen and emily um and i'll say that was a fantastic presentation and doing it among other challenges uh like your children and blue jays flying around behind your head um <laughs> made it even better uh there were a few questions that what i, I think what i'll do is i'm gonna ask the questions that came in the chat and then what I'll do is unmute everyone and if anybody has additional questions they can just ask them um, out loud for for Jen and Emily um, so the first question that came in um, I guess for, for either of you is was asking about sharp shin hawks uh, are they common in South Carolina Judy was wondering she feels like doesn't see a lot of them along the coast or um, could y'all speak to are they here at certain times of the year or are they less common in uh, in the coastal areas do you know oh uh, well i can speak to the fact that they are here usually more in the winter time so they're breeding a little bit further up north we see them a lot in migration and during the winter um as far as coastal regions i don't know if there's a difference in where they occur in south carolina emily do you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean i i they're they're much more rare i think um you know more more in state upstate i, I you would probably see more um i, I know like in my I, I would typically see them you know especially um after hurricanes um is 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 when i would see them um about this time of year um and um but yeah i think i think they're you know like you said their range is, is much more up north and they kind of just come through matt do you have any thoughts on that <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think you're right. I, 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 you know, the main difference to me, well, first of all, you know, if you can identify it from a Cooper sock, which is the classic challenge, one of the classic birding challenges, right, is downy versus hairy woodpecker, you know, Cooper sock versus sharp shin is, is, is so difficult. Um, but the main thing I feel like I know is what you said, Jen, I feel like I, I think about sharpies being only here really in the winter, whereas Cooper hawks are here year round, including breeding, you know, breeding in South Carolina, but um, I don't know that if it, I don't, I don't, I've never heard of, of, of the of thought of Cooper's hawks or Sharpson's hawks being much less common along the, or much rarer along the coast. I, I think they're uh, maybe slightly more common in the upstate as, as Emily suggested, but, um, but definitely. We did identify one on Saturday. 
uh, at Camp St. Christopher, but and they didn't question it, but I just was, you know, questioning, wondering if that really is what we saw. I believe it. <laughs> yeah, I would believe it be too. They're tough though. Uh, and, and Jen did a great job describing the difference, um, the, the differences, but the, uh, my problem has always been that I usually have to like put three of those together to feel comfortable about the identification and you're doing that in the field. It can be, can be a little challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, Next question was, um, Ed was asking, why don't we see many male harriers, many of that gray color morph of the, of the harriers? Uh, Emily or Jen, could y'all answer that? Yeah, I was, um, and, I, and I was going back and forth uh, with you, Matt, and, and, and it, makes, you know, it makes sense that you know, when you think of harriers, um, they don't get that, that gray, that beautiful um, gray and white coloration, the males. Um, you know, uh, they have to, when they're young, they, they're, they're darker, they look like the females. Um, so when we're seeing Northern Harriers, we're seeing three fourths of them, which would be the adult females, the immature females and the immature males. And I know that, and I, and I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know that there's a difference in their eye colors. It's something uh, that you guys can look up on your own, but um, the eye colors are very different even between between the immature, the, the young female and young male even also have different eye colors. So that it's, it's really interesting. So we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing these, these birds in, in plumage that, that looks very similar. Um, so three fourths of, of that pop population that's migrating. And so the odds of seeing a male is, is you know, is not as, um, um, you know, it's it, it, not as, uh, what am I, like my brain is just common. shot to common. There you go. Yeah, this is uh, the first yeah. shot in this PowerPoint is um, a male harrier that I caught at a banding station. Uh, and it was just a very unusual event to happen. So it was um, one of the best captures I've ever had. And just to see him up close, he was stunning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I've seen him and I haven't seen another male in years since I've caught him. Yeah, so. I've, I've only seen one in five years, yeah. Yeah. And I remain jealous of not being there that day, uh, to this day, Jen. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you, that, thank you for, for answering that. Um, next question is one that, that Kim just asked in the chat. Um, she was saying that she's, this is her first year on Seabrook Island, and she just saw a bald eagle recently and was wondering how long they would be in the area. Uh, well, I bet Emily probably knows the individual bird because she is so knowledgeable of all the nests in the area. I'll give you the, the quick short answer and then I'll give her the, the detailed answer. Um, they will be here, the adults will probably be here through the spring into early summer. They'll start to leave. Um, it you know, depends on the nest and how successful they are, but uh, they'll hopefully be nesting and having young birds. Uh, usually hatching between January, February time, give or take. The juveniles often hang around a lot longer, sometimes through the summer, um, depending on the individual bird. Uh, but we'll we'll have them for a while, through the winter, through the spring. But Emily, do you want to tell us more about the Seabrook Island nests? Because I bet you know a lot more about them specifically. Yeah, and I and I bet a lot of you know uh, Lori Porwall. Um, Lori Porwall is um, our surveyor um, out there for the Midwinter Eagle Survey. Um, so, and she's an incredible uh, bird photographer, nature photographer. Um, so I've, I've seen and, and been out to that nest. I, I've, I've seen her images um, out there on Seabrook Island. Um, yeah, it's in, in Kiowa also. So uh, yeah, they, they, right now they're, they're being um, incredibly territorial. Um, so this is usually the time of year that we, we start seeing um, potentially some disputes between males um, and, and also, uh, you know, maybe some, some, some newbies, uh, some, you know, some birds that are ready to, to ready, you know, ready to build a nest and, and, and find a mate for the first time. So they're looking for open territory. They're looking for food. Um, but yeah, there is, there is a nest on Seabrook Island. It's part of our, our route and, and they've been very successful the last three years. 
Thank you both for that. I'm wondering, just since we're on the topic of Eagles um, and surveying, could y'all talk just a little bit about, I'm not sure everybody on the call is familiar with the, with the quality Eagles survey. Could you talk a little bit about what that is and how it works? Sure. So I'll, I'll go in with a little bit of the history. So Eagles obviously declined greatly from um, DDT and hunting and a number of different factors down to the point where there are a handful of breeding pairs in South Carolina at the lowest point. And so in the 1970s, I forget which year exactly, the um, I believe it was the Fish and Wildlife Service established this full country uh, survey of all the eagles um, in the country. And so they started with roots where they knew eagle nests were and kind of built it over the years to monitor their uh, population status and, and I guess regeneration of their population over the years. Um, and so it's kind of evolved over time now that eagles are off the endangered list and they've done really well bouncing back. It's a great conservation success story. It's a little bit um, different because they're not sticking to just the historic roots anymore. But um, Emily, do you want to talk about the current status of, of the survey? Yeah, so uh, so 2007 is when um, the, the bald eagle was taken off of the endangered and threatened list. Um, and uh, since then, you know, they, they've, they've done well. Um, there's, um, once eagles get, once, once they find a territory, they become very in, invested um, in, in their uh, nesting spot in their territory. Um, and, and so, you know, we've seen, Jen and I, um, these nesting locations that have been around for, you know, 25 plus years. Uh, so, you know, in 1979, when, they, when there were only 11 nests in the state, you know, now we're looking um, into, into 300. Um, and um, and so, so Jen and I, and, and, and part of what, you know, as we kind of reevaluate wh what the survey looks like in South Carolina, because we're dealing with things that other states may not be dealing with, and that's, you know, development. And, um, and um, so, so we're, we're looking at now landfills and what we're, trying to get a good count of, you know, how, you know, how many birds are spending time at landfills, what, what, you know, what's their age. Um, and, and then also, you know, some, some areas that are changing rapidly, like the next in, if, if for you that are um, ever make it out to the next in Somerville area, you know, that, that area is changing very, very quickly. And, and there are some nests in that area that are going to be impacted by that. So, so, so Jen and I, you know, we, we, Every year, we kind of reevaluate what our goals are, um, you know, what what data we want to get, and then um, and then look for people to volunteer their time um, and knowledge um, of identifying uh, bald eagles, and um, and so we have created some new routes. Uh, um, the one on Seabrook is, I think, it's about four years old, um, and and it's now combined. It's a it's a Kiowa and Seabrook uh, route. So so your area is being covered. Um, but we do we do add new routes as we see the need um, as South Carolina changes and grows, especially in the low country. We've heard that the nest last year when we had the tornado go through that their existing nest was damaged and they've relocated. Mm -hmm. Is that fact or fiction? Um, that Jen, do you remember that from Lori Forwall? I remember hearing about the nest being damaged. Um, I can't remember if it was a tornado or not, and I don't know if they've relocated. I have to go back and look um, in our records from last year in our emails, because I know she reported back to me. I think that's in my part of the state, if I'm not mistaken. So I should know. I'm sorry. I can look it up, though. <laughs> I think yeah, it used to be on number three. Nancy, you probably know better. It used to be on number three, and now it's on number five of Crooked. Yeah, so it used to be on number three of crooked but now on number five of ocean there's a new nest did the tree die the i think the tree just um the nest collapsed out of the tree during that mini tornado that well i shouldn't say mini the tornado that we had on seabrook yeah this spring and i think the juvenile the juvenile was because wasn't that may so i mean he'd long oh, fledged yeah. he was yeah. still hanging around but he had long fledged yeah. Um, and so a neighbor of the new location said that it's the, you know, the Eagles came over to this new place and started constructing. So whether yeah. it's that pair 
we're assuming so. Oh we yeah, yeah. Course. They wouldn't let they wouldn't let other birds in to their. Yeah. that's their territory. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we assume that there's a nest, although I've never heard anybody confirm it on Marsh Gate. Is it Gate. Marsh Gate? I've heard. But has anybody ever seen that nest? I that think. I think Lori mentioned the fact that there, there last year potentially that there was a second nest in her notes. Um, so that that that'll be something that we'll be looking at this year in January. Okay. Yeah. And Marshgate um, could be close enough that the actual nest may be on Kasik. It's interesting how they they become almost habituated in some areas, um, but but bald eagles their natural behavior is that they want nothing to do with people, but you know, now that, you know, South, you know, we're, South Carolina and the low country is changing. These birds are becoming more um, habituated to people and not as afraid. And I know it, like there's, there's one nest um, in Mount Pleasant where that gets a lot of attention every year and the birds are slowly sort of building up a wall so that people can't see because really their, their nests are platform like, they're not cup shaped. So so um, any any kind of like um, any entry that any you know visionary entry that you can see into what they're doing, they start sort of building up that side. It's really interesting. They like their privacy, but 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 I think they are starting to adapt and um, and and becoming a bit habituated to the everyday. You know, people walking on the sidewalk. I know that the Kiowa nest is right off the sidewalk. I mean, it's, it's a tree, it, I think it's a city tree that was planted right off of a sidewalk on one of the main roads. So um, so some of the eagles have, have really adapted and then others, you know, struggle for that and, and it happens over time, but um, but you guys are in a good location um, to be looking, looking at eagles and it's only gonna get better um, in the months coming forward for eagles. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Jen and Emily, for that really detailed description. Um, I have one more question, and then and we can open it up to any from others uh, that came in over the chat. I will say really quick, though, that um, I feel like I'm obligated to say this, but Audubon South Carolina is a nonprofit organization. So if you want to support work like the Midwinter Bottle Eagle Survey and our other projects, um, we would certainly welcome you to do that. I know a lot of you already do and are supporting us through volunteering, but I'm going to put that a link to that um, button in the chat if, if any of y'all are interested. Um, the last question before we open it up uh, was, and, and this is a great question, one I think about a lot for songbirds and other birds too, but it applies to raptors is, Nancy was asking, are the birds like red-tailed hawks and red shoulder hawks, the raptors that you see throughout the year on uh, Seabrook, are they the same individuals or are you having different birds move in from season to season? Uh, and that's a great question, Jen or, Jen or Emily, you want to offer an answer? That is a good question. <laughs> you know, and I think it depends on what time of year it is. A lot of times birds will set up uh, very like strict territories, like Emily was mentioning with the bald eagles. Um, in the fall, you're going to have a lot of birds moving through. So I wouldn't count on any bird you see in the fall being the same bird if you saw, you know, something similar the next day. Um, other raptors like red-tailed hawks and osprey, they will also have pretty keen territories. So depending on if it's that bird's breeding season, I would say likely you're seeing the same individual multiple times, but there could be others that come and go. Sometimes osprey aren't overly territorial depending on where you are. I feel like in Florida you see one on every single lamppost if you're near the water, um, whereas up here they're a little bit more territorial. So anything to add to that, Emily? No, I think that was a great I always think about this with like my chickadees at my feeder. Am I seeing the same chickadees? And if you're not banding them, yeah. uh, it's so hard to know. And um, yeah. I think that's a, that's a great explanation of what we what we think we know, Jen. Um, all right, I'm unmuting everyone. Some of you are already unmuted, but if you would like to um, uh, ask a question for Jen or Emily, we have a look just a little bit more time. So feel free to feel free to hop in and ask. I've got two questions. Shoot. Um, we do a number of articles uh, on our blog and in the Seabrooker Salmon Tide Lines uh, on migration. And I was interested in the very, what the very first slide that we had showed the map of North and South America and the migration paths and it had 
what shorebirds and songbirds and all that stuff. Is that map available to us or is that proprietary um, Audubon? That is a good question. I think it, it came from Audubon's website. I may be able to find that for you. That one. Yes. Um, I feel like it's got to be publicly available, don't you, Matt? For sure, with a quick Google image search, we might be able to find it. If not, um, we can share it, I think. I was going to say, if we stall a little bit, maybe go to your next question. I may be able to find it. Uh, <laughs> the next question is also on the slide. Uh, the uh, rat poison slide. Is that one available? Because we, like Kiowa, uh, I guess we've been following them. They've been taking the lead, but we're just as concerned and trying to figure out our program and trying to figure out how to educate uh, island residents on not using the second generation rodenticides, which uh, I think has been the major problem. And is that it looks like that one came from Forestry Service. Um, this one is the National Park Service. And National Park I, Service. I had seen that someone posted online before, so I just I googled, uh, you know, rat poison, um, food chain effects, and it, eventually I found it. But um, if we can make a note and email that to you, if if at all possible, I'd love to have access to both the migration map and the rat poison graphic. You got it. I couldn't find it in the time that um, that you asked your second question, but yes, we will follow up and we can get that to you. Just Great. send it Thank to the, just send it to the Seabrook Island birders, and I'll make sure he gets it. Okay, cool. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent program. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Anybody have any last, last questions? I know we're getting on pretty late in the evening here. Yeah. Well, thank you all for taking the time. Um, I recorded this. I started it a little late, but I think I got the bulk, the bulk of it recorded. So I'll download that. I'll get that to um, Nancy or Judy um, or Ed, whoever, whoever I, I should get it to. We can make it available to those that weren't able to join, but Thank you all for giving us a part of your e evening and thank you again to Emily and Jen for an amazing program um, and uh, have a good rest of the night and we hope to do it again sometime. Okay, it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Thanks everybody. Excellent.